this evening's Classical Association, Manchester Classical Association talk, our uh, third public lecture, I think, in this series of 2023. And it's a huge honour to welcome Dr Alexandra Morris to speak to us this evening. Alexandra uh, is has her PhD from the University of Teesside and works on Egyptological topics, as well as being a disabilities activist working on museums and heritage around uh, disabilities studies in the modern and the ancient world. She's currently an associate lecturer at um, Lincoln University in their classical studies and heritage section and also an honorary research fellow at the University of Nottingham. And she's published widely around the themes of disabilities in antiquity and in and around museums and doing various projects around that. I'm not going to tell you about her publications because I know she's going to introduce us to some of those in the talk this evening. So I'll hand over straight to you, Alexandra. Yes. Thank you very much, April. And we'll go ahead and get started. I'm going to share my screen. Um, yes, OK, so thank you very much for having me. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, as April said, my research is primarily on disability during the Ptolemaic period in ancient Egypt. And my prior research has been on disability during Pharaonic Egypt. I would like to mention before we kind of go ahead and get started that I myself have a physical disability called cerebral palsy. And I also just at this point, before we go ahead and get started, want to mention that there will be mummified human remains shown throughout this presentation. So to kind of wow. give you an idea of how I got into the field, um, I was going along in grad school. Sorry, I'm hearing some background noise. Sorry, I'm trying to mute people. Can can we ask uh, the pe remind people to mute their microphones? Thank you. Thank you. All right. So to go ahead and get started, uh, I kind of got into this field. I was going along being an Egyptologist, got to grad school and became interested in this field basically because my first uh, graduate program was not the friendliest place in the world and I experienced kind of blatant ableist discrimination there and it just so happened that at my first grad program they also had a museum in which there was a man on display whom you can see here who was physically disabled himself as we see here he's buried with a cane and has one leg that's about six inches shorter than the other and he's from fifth dynasty egypt and this kind of gelled things in my brain and made me question things and made me ask, well, if there's him, then there's got to be other people like him. And that kind of sparked my research interest in this topic. Before we go ahead and get started, I would like to just introduce some basic concepts and context to make sure everyone is on the same page. So to start. What do I mean when I mean disability? Disability is kind of defined by the UN. It's a physical, emotional, or mental difference that limits a person's movement, senses, or activities. Um, when I mention ableism, which I will do later in this presentation, I mean prejudice and discrimination against those with disabilities, as well as the favoring of non-disabled people over disabled people. And when I talk about disabledism, it means basically a set of assumptions, conscious or unconscious, and practices that promote the differential and unequal treatment of people because of actual or presumed disabilities. So to move on, uh, in within disability studies, there are kind of two main understandings of disability that have made it over to ancient world studies. The first uh, model of disability as seen from disability studies, which is the older model, is what is known as the medical model of disability. And in this model, the disabled person essentially has to fix themselves to change and fit into society. So in this model, the problem is the disabled person. This is the older model, and this was kind of challenged by what is known as the social model in the 1970s by disability activists. So the other main model of disability as understood in ancient world studies is the social model. And in this model, rather 
than having the disabled person change and fit themselves into society and have to fix themselves to fit into society. In this model, um, an impairment is an individual's physical, sensory, or cognitive difference, and disability is the name that is given for the social consequences of having that impairment. So people with impairments under this model are disabled by society. So disability is therefore theoretically a social construct that can be changed and removed. However, there are some problems with this model as well, and I am not a fan, honestly, of either model. Um, with people with my disability or impairment, cerebral palsy, you can throw as many societal accommodations at me as you want. Um, it does not change the fact that my brain communicates differently with the rest of my body. So that's kind of my two cents on that. Um, before we continue, I also just wanted to have a note about language, and this is the blog post that was in the chat. Um, within Egyptological scholarship, as well as some ancient world scholarship, there has been this problem where this kind of ableist and disabledist bias is very prevalent in the scholarship. And it informs how people write about disability, and it informs also what we think we know about disability during this time period. So to give you two examples, um, Hephaestus suffered from a congenital deformity that limits his, his, his movement. This is what we'll see in a lot of the scholarship. And this first sentence kind of implies a negative judgment about disability. And it makes a judgment about Hephaestus' quality of life that we do not see in the second sentence, which is just more simply a statement of fact, if I just had a congenital mobility impairment or disability. And I also just wanna note at this time that within the dis disability community, there is primarily a preference uh, for identity first language, i.e. disabled person versus person with a disability with the exceptions being those with intellectual disabilities, and that's because of how this language has been used throughout time and the history of how this language came about. So I also just want to note that. And again, you can see that blog that's in the chat for more information about this. Um, so as I said, we've seen this in scholarship and in particular in historical scholarship about this. These, these are kind of two of the most blatant examples of bias I've seen, of ableist and disabled bias I've seen in the scholarship, to kind of give you an eye peek at just how prevalent this is. On the left, we have the greatest risk is war and death in battle. The greatest suffering is to survive but be disabled. Although numbers of casualties are often given by Hellenistic historians, we get no information about their treatment or about their future life. There is no way to estimate the percentage of crippled soldiers who live as a burden to their families, end quote. That is from War in Hellenistic World, a Social and Cultural History from 2005. And I have a picture of Philip II of Macedon underneath to kind of just show how ridiculous that statement is. He was a disabled king who was impaired in battle, who went on continuing to be king and ruling ancient Macedonia despite having those impairments. And on the right is unfortunately a much more recent example in Egyptological scholarship that shows just how much this language is still being used and still has not changed. And I will also try to, throughout the course of this talk, kind of prove this quote wrong. Um, so the quote is, those who are lucky enough to survive such scourges might still be scarred for life. Deformity is not often depicted in Egyptian sculpture and painting. The purpose of art being to portray an ideal state of affairs, but skeletons and remains tell a different story. Several fail to tell tear signs of hernias and spinal tuberculosis, which left sufferers with hunchbacks and twisted spines. In the pre-dynastic cemetery of Adama in Nefer, Egypt, two skeletons with the latter disease were uncovered, in each case accompanied by powdery representations of the deformity. There seem to be rare examples of sufferers celebrating their disability. In the similar vein, the steel of a doorman from the late 18th dynasty showed him with a wasted right leg and a deformed foot supporting himself on a long stick, end quote. And this is from Toby Wilkinson's Student Commons Trumpet, The Story of Ancient Egypt and the Hundred Objects, and was published just last year. So as I said, throughout the course of this talk, I will be kind of trying to prove this statement wrong. 
and showing that this language does influence how what we think we know about the ancient world. And we kind of need to stop doing this because it, it does have a negative impact, especially if you are a disabled student or a disabled scholar in this field trying to navigate things. It makes you think perhaps that you, perhaps you're not welcome there. So I just want to note that. So what evidence do we actually have of disability in ancient Egypt? We have falling. Um, primarily, or the most one of the most common examples is evidence for blindness and visual impairments. And to start us off, this is primarily from the Ptolemaic period and Greco-Roman period, this evidence, and I'll specify it's from other periods in Egypt's history as I go along. Um, one of the most common representations of disability having to do with blindness and visual impairments in ancient Egypt are these amulets that are known as ujats or wajats. What these are, are representation of the god Horus's essentially blind or restored eye. The myth goes essentially that Horus was one of the nine main Egyptian gods and his evil uncle Seth killed his father Osiris and took over to become king of Egypt. Uh, Horus was put away in hiding and grew up and challenged his uncle to become king. And when he did so, um, depending upon which version of the myth you believe, Seth either tore out one or both of his eyes. And he was therefore blinded by this. He won, but he was blinded. And what these amulets are, are representations of those blind, of that blind eye and restored eye, essentially, or eyes, depending upon which version of the myth you believe. They were used by the ancient Egyptians for an apotropaic function. So what that means is they were used to essentially ward off uh, negativity and evil and sickness. So these are actually being representations of disability, which are being used essentially for a positive function. We also have, also related to Horus up here, um, mummified bodies of ancient Egyptian mongooses, which are thought or to represent, again, that blind eye of Horus. And so we have those. We also have, again, these ujats in the forms of larger amulets that are being held by baboons. And baboons were associated with the silver coat and were therefore also, again, associated with Horus. So we have all these representations of blindness being associated with one of their Egyptian gods, that be god being Horus, who was one of the, their main nine Egyptian gods. For other representations we have from the Ptolemaic period, this here on the right is an example of an ostracon with a prayer written on it to the god Amun, and this is a representation of inquired blindness. Basically, um, the writer says that they've lost their vision and they don't understand why and they're wishing for the god to restore it. Um, the literal translation is, I can only now see darkness by day. Please restore my sight, essentially. So we have offerings here. So there was some expectation religiously that some kinds of blindness could be cured in ancient Egypt. We also have here, and this one, I should say this one on the top right, is from the Metropolitan Brooklyn Museum of Art. This one down here in the center is from the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And these over here are from the British Museum, the Metropolitan Museum, and Brooklyn. So going back to our Metropolitan Museum example, this is an example of a sketch that shows essentially a blind harpist. We have a long history in ancient Egypt of musicians being depicted without sight. And the reason why we think that they don't have sight is they are depicted with a singular line for their eyes. And other depictions of musicians show them with that full frontal eye that we're used to seeing. And there are some Egyptologists who argue that this is some Blindness is symbolic, but as we'll see, I don't feel necessarily that that's the case because you would therefore then have potentially scenes where theoretically all the musicians should have, 
be without sight, and they're not. Um, we also, on the lower right here, this is from the lower Greco-Roman period, later Greco-Roman period, have an example of a Theum mummy portrait. These were from later on in the Greco-Roman period. And these are supposedly so realistic that people have actually been able to diagnose various disabilities and disorders just from looking at them. This is a picture of a man, essentially, of a young man, essentially, who seems to have undergone some kind of eye surgery. Um, we see here on the right, he's kind of missing eyelashes off of this eye, and he also has a surgical scar, and that entire side of his face appears to be slack. Uh, this is talked about by Karev in the upcoming edited volume that I am co a co-editor of. It is on disability in ancient Egypt. And this is an example, again, of people perhaps wanting to be depicted how they would have been seen in life, impairment and all. And as for the example of the harpist, again, we have a long history of blind harpists in ancient Egypt. This is from the 19th dynasty tomb of the Bamun. And if we compare it to the other um, disabled harpist you just saw, we again have that singular line. And this is why I don't think necessarily that all blindness in, related to musicians in ancient Egypt is symbolic. We have him here with the one line for the eye, but we also have other musicians down here who have that full frontal eye and are therefore sighted, and they're even playing the same instrument that he is. So this just goes to show that there is a long history of this because this is from the 19th dynasty, which is about roughly 2,000 years before uh, the Ptolemaic period which is what the example you just saw four months first from. So moving on to other examples in terms of mobility impairments, we also have a lot of evidence for that as well. Um, in addition to the man who I showed you earlier, perhaps the most famous example of someone with a disability or a mobility impairment from ancient Egypt is the Pharaoh Tutankhamun, whom you can see here. Now I can give a whole other talk just on things from his tomb that are related to impairment. But I bring him up here because A, he is the most famous example, and B, he is also a really, really good example of this kind of ableist, underlying ableist bias that I was talking to you about earlier. He is believed to now theoretically have, at least according to some Egyptologists, uh, Kohler's disease, which is a disease of the foot, uh, a club foot, scoliosis, and cleft palate. And we can see him in this reconstruction of him with his supposed impairments. He has the one foot that's kind of bent and he is using a cane. But I just bring him up as an example of this ableist bias because again, he is a pharaoh, he is a king, and yet they are depicting him essentially in his underwear and kind of over-exaggerating perhaps those um, disabling features. And if we compare him to another king, King Philip uh, II of Macedon, who was another disabled king, but who was acquired his disabilities later in life, as opposed to Tutankhamun, who was born with them. We have Philip here dressed in his royal regalia. He's not dressed in his underwear, and he is given all the accoutrements of a king, as opposed to Tutankhamun, who's standing here in his underwear. I don't know why this is depicted the way it is, but that is the depictions. I also have from Tutankhamun, um, the evidence that I want to highlight from his tomb, that Egyptologists sometimes seem to want to twist themselves around into knots in denying his disability, which I also don't understand as someone who has studied his tomb. But within his tomb, we have these chairs. Basically, well, nearly all of his chairs that were found in thrones in his tomb uh, were found with these linen straps on them originally by Howard Carter. The two leading theories before I came along and proposed my own theory were that they either were designed to carry the chair or they acted as a do not sit sign to tell people not to sit in the king's chairs. Which honestly does not make sense. This man is a living God. You should not need to tell people not to sit in your chair. Like that doesn't make sense. My personal theory, given his impairments, 
and given the other evidence for disability that we have in his tomb, is perhaps that these acted as straps or harnesses or a seat belt to keep him upright in his chair. So in that case, it would be another example of ancient Egypt perhaps accommodating those with disabilities to be able to function within their society. So that's the placement of that. And as to why I don't think um, they are perhaps carrying straps, we do have other images of them carrying chairs in ancient Egyptian iconography. And they are carrying the chairs by the bottom of the chair, not the top of the chair where the straps are. So there's that. Um, in terms of other evidence for uh, physical impairments or lower limb impairments that we have in ancient Egypt, we have our friend who I showed, introduced you to earlier, but we also have uh, this person here on the right who was introduced to you in the Wilkerson quote earlier uh, with a little bit of that bias. His name is Roma. He's from the 19th dynasty. He was a doorkeeper who worked for the Lady Yamia. And as we can see here, we have one leg that is significantly weaker and more atrophied than the other. Uh, the main accepted theory up to this point was that he had polio. However, again, in this edited volume, and this has been a theory that has been put out by Aidan Dodson, um, reflecting on his own lived experience with cerebral palsy, he thinks this is actually more likely that this might have been cerebral palsy. But the important things about Roma here is, A, he was in a position that he could do given his impairment. If you're a doorkeeper, you don't have to necessarily be walking around a lot so you can sit and man the door. Um, he is shown here with his family. So he has was integrated into society. He had a wife. He had a child. He has a stick that he is using as a literal support here. And if we remember Tutankhamun and our other friend here, they were also given sticks. And going back to Tutankhamun briefly, we have someone... Tutankhamun was buried with over 131 walking sticks in his tomb, some of which shown signs of being used uh, during his lifetime, and one of which is inscribed as being his favorite. And we still have Egyptologists who are arguing that no, all of Tutankhamun's walking sticks were just status symbols because he was king, that he didn't actually use them, which again kind of shows this underlying bias. But we have Roma again here using a walking stick to help with his disability. And what is happening on this stela here is he is making offerings to the goddess Astarte. So we also have some cross-cultural interaction going on here too, because Astarte is not a native Egyptian goddess. So, but he is again being integrated into that society. Um, moving on. Yeah, disability in ancient Egypt is so common that you kind of have to, when you go and look at things, really have to look because people will pop up in everyday scenes. This is the stele, the overseer of the fortress of Intef. This is located in the Metropolitan Museum of Art. There is a disabled person in this scene, but it may take you a couple minutes to find them. I'll give you a couple minutes to look and I'll change the slide. Okay. So the disabled person is actually here in this lower register. We have again using a man using a walking stick for support. And if you look at his limbs in comparison to everyone else, they again to be very atrophied and so, and kind of not working correctly. But he is again integrated into the scene. We don't even know who he is besides just being a worker who is coming to make offerings to Intep and his wife, who we saw there seated on the left. But this just goes to show how common disability does seem to be depicted in ancient Egyptian art, uh, in contrast to that quote that I showed you earlier. So moving on to another disability, and this is where more of my own research comes in, uh, cerebral palsy is a disability that affects movement, balance, posture, coordination, and motor skills. It is often but not always caused by brain damage occurring uh, before birth or during or shortly after birth, and is often associated with premature birth. It is one of the most common uh, congenital disabilities or disabilities that you're born with today. 
and is the most common physical disability in childhood, affecting every four out of 100 births worldwide. And I suspect that numbers in the ancient world were either similar or higher because we did not have the kind of interventions that we have uh, with childbirth today. And there are several different subtypes within the disability. Uh, some people have muscles that are more rigid. Some people have muscles that are essentially too loose. Or you can have my kind where you have essentially a mixture of both. And what I have is known as mixed type CP. Why this is important, I'll come to you in a minute. Um, but before we get there, so what do we have in terms of historical context of cere cerebral palsy? We have, first of all, the 13th dynasty mummy of a woman called Gehazet, uh, who was buried in the Drabal Naga Cemetery in Western Thebes. And she's talked about more extensively by Kyle Jordan in a presentation that he did. Um, but she was a middle-aged woman who essentially was analyzed by um, osteologists and was determined to have CP. Uh, the reason why they think that she has cerebral palsy is because of this positioning of her arm, which you'll notice there is very, very bent and not an unusual position that you will see for CP, and also because she, with looking at her skull, she has wear on more on one side of her body than the other, which shows that she was using one side of the muscles on one side of her face a lot more than the other. And her teeth also show signs of being calcified, which means that she would have been drooling a lot, essentially, or had an excess of saliva. Um, what we know about her, though, is that she was a noble woman who lived during this time period. She was married to a court judge named Amini, and she was a member of the king's court. So she was actively participating in that society, and she died when she was middle aged. We also have a later uh, 19th dynasty example. This is actually another pharaoh. His name is Sipta, and we again. Uh, Egyptologists looked at him and kind of determined he might have CP, again because of the positioning of his arms. His arms are apparently so rigid that they could not get them into the normal X shape that you would see with mummification. Um, and instead they're in this L shape. We also have his foot where again the muscles are so rigid that they are basically um, the one foot is pointed straight downwards and they were unable to bend it back to mummify it in the correct position. Um, going back to Dodson, this has traditionally been described as either club foot or he has been also traditionally described as having polio, but Dodson again reinterpreted him to perhaps having cerebral palsy as well. And this has been interpreted by other non-Egyptological uh, professionals as also potentially being CP who are med medical professionals, but not necessarily Egyptologists. From the Greek side of things, because this period, uh, the Ptolemaic period, is a mixture of Greek and Egyptian culture, we have in Herodotus a description of a noble woman named Labda who had feet and legs that were in the, basically the Greek letter Lambda. So again, you have this kind of weird musculature again. And in the 5th dynasty BC, in the medical text of Hippocrates, we have him describing symptoms that also seem to match CP and what you would do to treat infants with that condition. So why this is important necessarily um, is A, during the Ptolemaic period, this is from the British Museum, this is again from the later Greek and Roman period, and this was originally discovered in Alexandria, Egypt. We have this wonderful figure of a child who also potentially seems to have cerebral palsy. Uh, this child was actually originally uh, first noticed by disability activist Keith Armstrong as possibly having CP. Uh, this child is using a wheeled walking aid. And if you look at the musculature on the back of the leg, you have one leg is much more musculature than the other. Here you can see the difference, the disparity in them. And if you look at the pose of this child, it also seems to uh, imitate what is known as a Krauss gait, which is commonly seen in some people who have cerebral palsy. What is interesting about this figure is, though, it is, we don't know the gender of this child, um, and this is a mold-made figure. 
So this is, was produced for a mass art market, which means that people were buying these figures, and we don't necessarily know why or what the original purpose was, but it means that there was a market for this kind of art and that disability seems to have been common during this period. Um, I theorize that we don't necessarily know the gender of this figure because it could have been painted to theoretically be whatever gender you wanted. Uh, the ancient Egyptians traditionally, and even the Greeks did this to a certain extent, did too, uh, painted darker skin for men and lighter colored skin for women. So this could, you could theoretically customize it based on what you wanted, especially if it was well paid. Um, and this here on the right is just a reconstruction again of what that original wheeled walking aid would have looked like. And again, this is also an older, it seems to be an older child. So this is probably someone who is using a mobility aid to get around as opposed to someone who is perhaps just learning to walk as well. So it also again kind of shows a societal accommodation of those with impairments within ancient Egypt during this time period. And I have theorized in my doctoral work that perhaps that disability was so common um, during this period, or rep artistic representations of disability continue being common during this period because we have, for perhaps the first time in history, an elite class of disabled people because of the policies of Alexander the Great, which were continued under the Ptolemies, where they were essentially giving land grants to uh, war veterans and who were more than likely disabled because of war and other things. So this meant that perhaps we have a class for the first time in history of war veterans who were in power politically, socially, and religiously during this time period. They are therefore potentially then going to make art that is reflective of what they know or are familiar with. Um, so why this becomes important or why I'm doing this whole thing about cerebral palsy, I have also argued within my own research that Harpocrates himself may have had cerebral palsy. Who Harpocrates was, he was the son of Isis, the heir of Osiris, and son of Serapis. He is a Ptolemaic god of secrets, confidentiality, silence, the embodiment of hope, and representative of the newborn son. He is again a protector god. He is the protector of mothers and children. He is associated with the solar cult of Tosachiris, the mortuary cult, and cult of Serapis. He is anecdotally known as Horus the Child. And he's associated with the god Horus. And most importantly, he is described by the ancient historian Plutarch as, quote, prematurely delivered and weak in his lower limbs. And I have basically gone through, as we'll see, images of him and seem to um, have discovered that the ancient Egyptians and the ancient Greeks seem to be deliberately depicting him with symptoms of CP in their artwork. So to start us off... This is the pose that I talked to you about earlier. This is what is known as the crouch feet, where you have the knees kind of bent or flexed and they can't extend fully because of mus uh, rigid musculature. So this is the pose. These are the figures of Harpocrates that we have from the Ptolemaic period. In all of these, and these are again amulets that were designed to essentially protect the wearer or small statues that you could put in your household shrine. Uh, we have these figures with this bent posture, essentially. And these have been traditionally described in the scholarship as sitting. However, we do also have examples of him sitting. And in the examples that we have of him sitting, his hand is flat out as if it's resting on something. And in the rest of these examples, his hand is straight down. So if he was sitting, it would have gone through whatever he was sitting on, the chair. Um, and I just want to point out, and in this particular example, we also, again, have that knock knee posture where it seems to be very exaggerated throughout. Uh, so we have that. In terms of that, so those were more Egyptian-looking ones. We also have more Greek-looking ones where he's depicted as an infant. And we see it here. Again, this is the reference pose. This is hypotonia. You have decreased muscle tone. Um, as an infant, which is common with cerebral palsy. And if we look at these Greek examples of him being held by his mother, Isis, these are again from Ptolemaic period, 
he has kind of that matching system. He can't hold his head up. His knees kind of flare out um, in that kind of crouch feet posture again. Um, so those are the more Greek looking examples. And the more Egyptian looking examples, we're seeing the same thing. He again has that kind of floppy musculature. Isis in both of these examples is trying to breastfeed him or nurse him. He's not interested. And in this particular example from the British Museum, his right arm seems to be twisted in kind of this pose. And I know with me using my own personal embodiment, when I'm very, very distressed because the CP or very, very sick because the CP is worse on my right side, my right arm will twist around backwards like that. So there's that. We also have examples of him as an infant. Again, we have the reference pose as seen as those with cerebral palsy. And we're looking at him. He's again kind of seemingly struggled to hold his head up in certain examples. Uh, we have his legs kind of dragging out behind him in other examples or underneath him and kind of just a weird posture that matches that. Um, again, this is the reference pose. And again, these are uh, depictions of him. These would have been, again, put in personal household shrines or in other religious contexts. Again, in all of these, his legs are dragging out behind him. And it doesn't matter if he's more Greek looking, he's more Egyptian looking, if he's nude, if he's clothed. And in some of these, we also have him riding on the backs of animals. And again, his legs are in that kind of weird posture in pretty much all of these. The other thing to note in some of these, and I talk about this more in my chapter in this upcoming edited volume, is he also has lotuses. Um, clustered by him in some of these images. And lotuses are a representation of the ancient Egyptian sun. They are associated with the solar cult. But if we look at where they are clustered, and I find this really interesting, they are either always clustered on top of his head or by his legs. And we know um, lotuses in ancient Egypt were also traditionally used as pain relief medicinally. And cerebral palsy can also be quite painful depending upon the amount of uh, muscle contracture that you have. And they are clustered by the two areas given the quote from Plutarch that we know would have been affected by the CP, namely his head and his legs. And we know to a certain extent that the ancient Egyptians and the ancient Greeks did have some understanding of some things being neurological in nature. So they did seem to have some kind of understanding that things could affect you via your brain. So we have that. Again, these are more Greek-looking examples of him. We again have that uneven musculature that I pointed out between the legs on both of these. And this is more Greek-looking examples. And this one, the medium change, so this is a bronze, small bronze uh, amulet. This is in stone, and we're seeing the exact same thing. Moving on to more Egyptian looking examples, we again have him here. These are Sipai. Uh, these would have been used medicinally by the ancient Egyptians um, to help treat or cure illnesses. We have Harpocrates here um, standing on the back of crocodiles. And what's really interesting is he's holding on to two papyrus canes or being supported by two uh, papyrus canes in these examples. And he is also strangling snakes and basically showing that he is dominating nature and controlling chaos in these examples. And again, in both of these, although you can see it less here, uh, we also have him being depicted with Bas, who is another ancient Egyptian disabled god who we'll meet a little bit later. And in this example, that's with the Ptolemies. So this is uh, one of the Ptolemies and his queen making offerings to the gods. We again have Harpocrates here, and we have the goddess behind him again offering him a cane. Now, this could be symbolic, as we said, but it also could theoretically be a mobility aid as well. And we also, I just want to point out, have that imbalance in the leg musculature yet again. We also have statues of statues of Harpocrates. And in these statues of him, we again have that leg imbalance as well. And that kind of weird, again, uh, wide gate stance or knock knee posture. And then this particular one where the statue of Harpocrates is being carried by statues of priests, 
we again have him with lotuses on his head. Now, all right. We also, in other examples of him, this is him being carried by a priest. We again have his legs squared out. This is another interesting example. This is a priest wearing an amulet of Harpocrates. What is interesting about this priest, however, is the positioning of this priest's arms. If we look at the priest's arms here, um, he seems to be very, very reminiscent of the positioning that we saw Gehazet's hands in earlier. So I'm wondering if this is a disabled priest, perhaps, of the god Harpocrates, which means we would therefore have a disabled person working in a religious context in ancient Egypt. This is from the British Museum, by the way, on the left. Um, Harpocrates also has a feminine form known as Harpocrates. And again, this was depicted in more Greek and more Egyptian looking examples. And again, we have these same features showing up in all of them. We have her again with the kind of that wide gate or wide base stance on the back of a ram here. We also have her in the nude where you have the imbalance in the musculature. Here again in the more Asian looking example, where we have that one knee kind of bent. Again, in a more Greek looking example, and here she is sitting again in a more Greek looking example, again with the lotus imagery on her head. Um, yes, and I just also want to point out in the, in the examples that we have of them riding on the backs of animals, that could also potentially be a mobility accommodation as well. Um, because animals could be used and we know were used by in the ancient world as essentially mobility aids to help people get around. Um, I've also taken this research further and started looking back at other time periods um, to both the later Roman time period and some of the earlier time periods as well because images of Harpocrates actually started appearing as early as the New Kingdom where he was known as Horace the Younger. And this is consistent in all of them. This is the later Roman example um, again, the medium has changed, but we still have that weird posture where he's sitting, but he again has the one leg more bent than the other. Again, a late period example where he has traditionally been described as sitting, but if you look at that, that's not sitting. There's no way, I don't know how you can tell. Again, Roman period with the one leg dragging behind the other. Um, Roman again, one leg dragging behind the other. Um, Roman, he's sitting on the lotus here with the one leg straight out. Um, again, late period and third intermediate period he, where Isis is breastfeeding from Isis, seemingly uninterested and again leaning over to that one side. Um, this is a really good example here, a later Ptolemaic period where you can just see how crooked he's looking here, essentially. Earlier New Kingdom example, again, he would have had the one leg probably flared out there. Uh, this is him with the goddess Wajit. So even when he's with a different goddess, he's again leaning over to that one side and very not interested in breastfeeding. Um, okay, another Roman example where he's sitting, where he's seated, but you can again kind of see scoliosis here. And as someone with CP, I also do have scoliosis, so that's commonly seen in those with CP. This is from the Brooklyn Museum over here on the le on the left. And this is interesting because this kind of refutes the argument that, well, maybe they just all age to be this way. Um, he is here and he's in the mold that made him. So the mold that made him survives. And we can see here that he is in, again, that kind of um, bent knee position or crouch gate position in the mold. So they seem to have been making him deliberately in that position rather than this being a result perhaps of age. Um, other examples, another late period example, and this one, his finger is just completely bent back. This is from uh, Chicago. Again, examples where he was supposedly sitting, where if, if they have him on the seat and that doesn't look right ex exactly. And another example where he's breastfeeding and again, not interested and again, leaning over to the one side. This is from the earlier Sayite period. We have his mom, Isis, and his aunt, Nephthys, essentially supporting him, and he's in the middle. Um, again, from the Durham Museum, again, he's breastfeeding and again, kind of um, over to the one side of both of these. This is from Durham. 
We have other interesting examples from German museums where he is seated and being protected essentially by that dwarf god Bess, um, who is positioned in all of these by his legs. And in these cases, he is seated directly on a lotus and papyrus throne. So he is again being seated directly on those lotuses where he would need essentially that pain relief. Again, this, this, is, this is from the British Museum. This goes to show you just how small these amulets are in real life. So you required a great deal of skill to make these. These were not necessarily then artistic mistakes. Um, so and I also have some comparanda from the Brooklyn Museum where we have other depictions of infants from earlier and later time periods that are not Harpocrates, and the ancient Egyptians seem to be very perfectly capable of depicting people with nice straight backs and infants who are engaged with breastfeeding, and they seem to be deliberately depicting him not doing either of those two things. So this is the pharaoh Pepi II um, being depicted with his mother. He has a nice straight back. This is a princess nursing her infant. That infant is very actively engaging with breastfeeding in ways that Harpocrates was not. Again, another uh, Middle Kingdom to intermediate example where the infant is actively engaging with breastfeeding here. So that's kind of Harpocrates in a nutshell. Moving on to dwarfism, um, we have to kind of start us off someone who's very reminiscent of those, some of those Harpocrates images. That god is the god Taikos, who is a dwarf form of the god uh, Ta, who was the god of craftsmen in ancient Egypt. These are again used as apotropaic amulets to essentially ward off harm and protect the wearer from evil spirits and illness. So we again have this ability being associated essentially with protective or a positive connotation. And the other thing about Ta that is interesting is they sometimes depicted him with more than one head so he could basically ward off evil from all directions. Um, then we're moving on. Our other main god who was believed to have dwarfism in ancient Egypt is the god Bess. Bess was another protective deity who was also associated with women in childbirth. We already saw that he showed up with Harpocrates in a lot of contexts. But there are so many different depictions of him that we essentially can't classify them all. But we do know that he was an Aphrodite deity. We have him depicted here in the pose of a Greek or a Roman soldier. We have him dancing with musicians here. Um, we have him with a worshiper here, uh, acting as an atlas or telemon, which is essentially the male support of a building. We have him being worn as an amulet here by a temple boy. And Bess also had a feminine form like Harvacrates, which I also find interesting because they're both disabled gods, known as Basset, who we can see here and here. And this is also from Durham. Bess also was found in the form of feeding jars that we know that the ancient Egyptians were used medicinally um, to help those who, for whatever reason, could not eat solid food or could not breastfeed to essentially um, make sure that they got nutrients that way. Okay, and in terms of other examples of dwarfism we have from ancient Egypt, this is from much earlier in Egypt's history. This is from the Old Kingdom. So this is from the time period of the Great Pyramids. We have the dwarf person named Seneb, and he's from the 5th dynasty. His name in ancient Egyptian, which you can see here, means healthy. This is him being depicted with a family portrait with his wife and two children. His wife was a priestess named Sinites. We know Seneb was a priest and member of the royal court during the Old Kingdom. He served in the funeral of, Ka of Khafre, and we know that he was a very, very important and wealthy man during this time period because he kind of essentially boasts on his tomb chapel that he had over 40,000 cattle. We unfortunately don't know if his position was hereditary or if he worked his way up in society to get this, but we do know he was important. Uh, and the work of Jordan has also pointed out um, the ancient Egyptians had this form of art known as an art that was known as hierarchical proportion, where the biggest person is the most important and within his tomb the artist kind of depicted him with that in mind but I ran into a problem with also trying to depict his wife in the same scenes so that what they ended up doing to get around that was depicting her in the register underneath him 
And she's mirroring in all of these scenes what he is doing. So in this particular example, he's meeting with three officials. Here she is down below playing with their three children. They're both seated. They are essentially mirroring each other. And that's important in a way because it shows that they are both actively engaged in providing uh, for their family and actively engaging in societal functions that would have been expected of him. And there's no difference essentially between them, even though he's disabled and she is not. Um, and I also just wanted to point out here he helped just how much the artist is showing him. We have him again meeting with officials. Here he is meeting on the cane for support. Uh, here he is hunting in the marshes. Um, and here he is being carried around in the poliquin. That seems to have been custom made for his size. And we have other objects in his tomb, such as chairs and stools, that have seemed to have also been custom made, essentially, to fit his shorter stature as well. Um, finally, I will be wrapping up soon. Uh, we have a possible example of intellectual impairment, also from this period. And this is Philip III Aridaeus. This is Alexander the Great's older half-brother who became co-regent with Alexander's infant son of Macedon after Alexander the Great died. And he was supposedly given a guardian because he seemed to have had, according to the ancient sources, some kind of unspecified intellectual impairment. And we're not exactly sure what it is. But what I find interesting about him is the ancient Egyptians seem to be granting him agency in ways that modern scholars are not. This is from the British Museum. This is Eclipsydra. Um, that is a water clock. And we have him here being depicted as Pharaoh of Egypt, making offerings to the goddess Sekhmet, who is the goddess of war which makes a ton of sense because we know that this period was again a time of warfare so he is therefore offering making offerings to ensure egypt's military victory during this time period we also have him um, being depicted on the temple of karnak and in this on the inscriptions on the wall the ancient egyptians seem to be giving him direct credit for restoring an earlier temple of an earlier pharaoh known as Thutmosis ii we also have coinage of, of his coinage as well, where he is noting himself on the back as being king. So this is Philippus Basileus, so Philip the king. And on the front, he's depicting Alexander as Heracles. So he is making the um, association of himself with his old uh, younger brother, um, Alexander. And referring back to the family lineage of that was supposed to be descended from Heracles. And he has Zeus on the back, who the family was supposedly descended from as well. Now, I say that the ancient Egyptians seem to be granting him agency that modern scholars do not. Because after Alexander died, Alexander's body was hijacked and taken to Egypt by a general whose name was Aridaeus. We know from other ancient sources that the ancient Greeks like to give, and the ancient Macedonians like to give people nicknames. We have Clytus the Black and Clytus the White. There is no distinction in the ancient sources between these two Aridaeuses whatsoever. However, modern scholars seem to have created a second Aridaeus, who they refer to as General Aridaeus, who is supposedly have taken this body to Egypt. And I'm not so sure that they weren't the same person, essentially. It would have made sense to give the body to the co-regent of Macedon after Alexander's death. If you had the body, you had political power. He would have taken it to Egypt because we believe perhaps that that is where Alexander said he wanted to be buried. And Ptolemy, depending upon, again, which ancient sources you want to believe, may have been another half-brother who was related to both Aridaeus and um, Alexander the Great. We also have an evidence uh, during his lifetime, which again, a lot of other historians seem to have overlooked and I've written on this, um, of something known as the Pixadorus Affair. And this is when Alexander and Aridaeus were growing up and were still alive. Um, Aridaeus was promised essentially in marriage to a nobleman named Pixadorus who was located in a strategically important location for Philip II's preparations to invade Macedon. 
Alexander kind of tried to torpedo the marriage because he saw Aridaeus as a threat and told uh, Pixodorus that he really didn't want his daughter marrying Aridaeus. He should have asked for Alexander's hand in marriage instead. And Philip found out about this and kind of stopped every old marriage negotiations and basically punished Alexander by banishing all of Alexander's friends. The key takeaway here, though, that, again, the other historians seem to have overlooked, is Aridaeus, despite having the supposed intellectual impairment, was seen as capable of ruling a satrapy because he would have inherited it after Pixodorus died, and he was seen as, as capable of uh, getting married and reproducing children as well, because that would have been a, a, a essential with that position. And he, yeah. Yeah, those are my two main points about that. Um, so, and that would create a later example, perhaps, of why he was in Babylon and Alexander's death to even become king, because a lot of historians are like, why was he there? Well, if Alexander had placed him in charge before he left to go out on campaign, that would have made perfect sense. And we know that he was capable, supposedly, of throwing a satrapy based on that incident. So that's why I'm again saying the ancient Egyptians here seem to be giving him agency that modern scholars don't. And this up here is just his name in a cartouche. So they are recognizing him essentially as king. Only kings had their names in cartouches as well. So finally, I want to end on an example, which are also Ptolemaic, um, of prosthetics. Now, this over here are from the earlier time period. These are from the Middle and New Kingdoms. Um, these are toe prosthetics. These have been discussed in the work of Jackie Finch uh, and have been found to be fully functional and made to essentially replace the um, parts, the toes that were missing. And she tested them out on uh, modern day people who needed prosthetics, uh, replicas of them, and they found them actually more comfortable to wear than their modern uh, prosthetics that they use today. And I also just want to point these out because they show essentially that there were different types that you could get based on how much money you have. This one up here, which is a more expensive version, is made out of wood with leather straps. This one down here is a less expensive version made out of cartonnage, which is essentially a paper mache. This one is in the British Museum. In terms of other prosthetics we have, this is from the Durham Oriental Museum. We have this woman who was from the Ptolemaic period. We know that she was a priestess, and when they found her, they discovered that she had an arm prosthetic, which you can see there. And researchers now believe that she essentially was born without her uh, right arm, and that that prosthetic was essentially added when she was mummified, and if so, that may show a change in attitudes towards disability during this period. Because if we remember Gehazit and Sipta, their bodies were not altered in the mummification process. They were kind of left as they were, whereas hers is altered. And that may have been a personal choice on her part, or it may not have. We don't essentially know there's not enough information. Um, when researchers originally found her, um, they also at the time misidentified her as a man, as a male priest. But that has since been revised as well. So we don't know that much about her. We also don't know um, what her name was because that has unfortunately been lost. We do know that she was middle-aged when she died, and we do know again that she was a priestess. So to kind of end, in the ancient world, as I've kind of hoped to demonstrate tonight, disabled people lived and thrived. They seem to have been represented without stigma and art and were incorporated into various levels of society. Uh, when disability is discussed in scholarship, it often contains ableist and disabled biases. Um, and museums have this material in their collection in seemingly abundant qualities. From my doctorate, I found over 600 examples of disability-related artifacts from one roughly 300-year time period. It's just a question of identifying it and creating programming from that um, display. And disability narratives and their societal applications have long been overlooked. Harpocrates, an example, is a representative of how disabled people were portrayed mythologically and kind of this fusion of cultures that was going on during this time period. Uh, Philip III Aridaeus is also representative of this fusion 
and the continuation of the policies of Alexander the Great that continued after his death. And I hope overall to have demonstrated this is an example of why a disabled perspective is needed in the ancient in the study of the ancient world. Thank you. And yes, just to kind of final kind of wrap up, uh, the book and the authors I've been referencing tonight are in um, the edited volume Disability Ancient Egypt and Egyptology or yesterday's, which will be coming out later next year. We're thinking hopefully um, November, December, and these are all the various contributors we have for this. So thank you. Questions? Thank you so much, Alexandra. That was